Hello, everybody. As Ronnie, as Ronnie said, I'm Gina Matthews from Clarkson. And he had actually asked me to say something closer to 4 o'clock, but um, I had classes and this was as early as I could get here. So the first thing I'm going to do is do a, a quick pitch for Clarkson's PhD program and master's program. We, uh, those are degrees that you can get um, through distance learning. Through, uh, uh, you know, in fact, in this room are two people who got their PhDs with me remotely, uh, <laughs> Josh and Ryan. Um, so um, if anyone is interested in either um, studying at the Clarkson campus in Potsdam, New York, way, way upstate, or interested in taking some classes uh, distance, I'd be happy to talk with you some more about that. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about big data's big problems. And before, I'm mostly going to be talking about problems. But I will start by talking a little bit about the good things, the, the potential of big data. Um, so many sources of data, so many things that we can be um, recording from scientific data to uh, financial data to data about people and so many opportunities to optimize and understand ourselves, our bodies, our interactions with other people and to understand the world. I don't know if anybody has been following, this is some stuff uh, out of the news right now, um, hackers saving some of the you know, uh, science data, you know, climate change data, things like that before uh, concerns that it might just be deleted. So clearly that indicates the power of that data to say things about our world, to help us um, uh, really make a difference. And you see some of these other things up here, searching for a cure for malaria, you know, combating counterfeit drugs. Who wouldn't want all of those things? Those sound like great things. Sign me up for that, right? Um, this is a quote I love. Um, it says, each of us now leaves a trail of digital exhaust. So here we are driving our little cars through the game of life. You ever play that game? The game of life, you get that little car and you're driving with your little stick person. Um, so as we drive our car through life, we are now leaving a trail of digital exhaust, an infinite stream of phone records, texts, browser histories, GPS data, and other information that will live on forever. So, one of the things to understand about big data is that it's, of course, made up of many, many tiny pieces of data. And when you're talking about data about you, it's really important to think about the implications of that. And I don't know how much you sit around thinking about this, the trail of your digital exhaust and the way, and who it belongs to. Who has control over it? If it's going to live forever, whose decision is that? Uh, who can it be swapped with? Who can it, what, can be, what can it be aggregated with? What kind of decisions can be made? But first, let's just spend a little bit of you know, time reflecting on the contents of our digital exhaust. So um, you know, your emails. I currently have, people like to tease me about this, I currently have 53,291 unread messages in my mailbox. And that is not a joke. I'd be happy to show you. <laughs> um, in my defense, I think I can tell you know a preview of a message that I really don't think I need to read it. That's just the unread ones. If you got a hold of all of my, I don't even delete messages anymore. I don't archive them. I don't. I don't uh, you know sort them. I don't. I just never do anything with them all. They just sit there forever. And you could tell a lot about me by my emails. Certainly, social media. You know, we very actively want to connect with one another and share tons of information. Um, I heard someone say, um, if the government said that every time you made a friend, you had to go report that at the police station, you'd be pretty outraged, right? But on Facebook, we kind of do that, <laughs> right? Made a friend today, just want to tell you. Um, our web browsing history, or our search, our Google search history. I don't know, is there really almost anything more revealing than the inside of your, of your, inside of your brain than what you search for? And we're going to see an example of what happens with search data, an example of anonymous release, anonymous release of search data, 
Um, you may have heard that case, but we'll talk about that later. Um, how, just think, how often is your cell phone more than five feet away from you? Like, and, and um, that, just think of the rich information of your location. Again, if, you, if the government said you had to wear something that would report your location at all times, you'd be outraged, right? But we're pretty happy to do that. Um, our purchase history, have you ever just looked at your credit card statement at the end of the month and thought what it says about you? Not just what you bought, but oh yeah, I went there and there and there and there, and actually did that every Saturday. I guess that's what my Saturdays look like. Um, all your wish lists, so not just the things you bought, but the things you wish you could buy. You know, um, products you viewed, reviewed. Uh, you know the thing about frequent buyer cards, right? You know, that's just so that they can, even if you use cash or whatever, that they can, they can put all of your purchases together as belonging to one entity. That's, that's the purpose of them. Of course, cameras. You take pictures of you, other people. Other people take pictures of you whether you want them to or not. And even strangers sometimes take pictures of you. In fact, I took a picture from the back because um, you know I'm excited to be here and I'm speaking. And you know some of you are in it. Sorry about that. Um, and you know, um, facial recognition is amazing these days. So you're just you know a stranger in somebody's picture, and you know there you are. Uh, GPS tags in pictures. Uh, you know that's not even you know talking about things like Fitbits, right? That would you know report your Maybe your heart rate or other other wearables that would you know, report every step you take, <laughs> um, every step, every heartbeat. That's starting to sound, you know. Uh, if you're not scared yet, you should be. Um, license plate readers, you know, that can you know every time your car goes by, can see exactly where your car was or place you drove. Um, you know, your passports, anything. You know, do you guys know the thing about the enhanced driver's license in New York, the RFID? You know, um, anybody have one of those? And, and they give you a sleeve, right, to put them in. Do you keep them in the sleeve or do you not keep them in the sleeve? So if you, um, when they're outside the sleeve, the thing about them is they can be read from a distance. So like say you have a credit card, you know you gave it to someone and they swiped it. And something that is RFID can be read just as you're walking down the street. And it's not like when they read it, they see Gina Matthews, my social security number, in plain text. But they see a string that if they could see it one day and then they see it the next day, they can say, oh, that was the same person, a little bit like those frequent buyer cards, maybe. And then if you ever do go in and identify yourself or buy something or whatever, then it can be linked again at any time. It could be linked to who you, who you are. Um, for satellite imagery, I'm sure you've you know, checked out Google Earth and you know, zeroed in on your house. You're like, there, I'm sunbathing. Isn't that weird? <laughs> right? Happened to be that day. Um, you know, E-readers, think about that one. I, I like to tell my students this. You know, I assign some reading, and then you do bad on the quiz, and you're like, I'm just bad at quizzes. And I'm like, no, actually, you know, the, you did it on an e-reader, and I can tell you spent exactly like 1.3 seconds on four of the pages, and that's it. <laughs> that's it. And you didn't know that necessarily ahead of time. Does that sound fair? You think you might like to know the ways in which you're being surveilled ahead of time. Or you think about, you know, books you've read and read a couple times, the parts you dwell on, the parts you go back to again and again. You know, that's all there in the e-readers. Um, your you know streaming video, your YouTube, you know um, all of those things. Okay. Now I'm sure I didn't say anything you didn't know, but there is something about putting it all up there together, right? That makes you swallow a little hard, right? Is this the world we want to live in, where we don't own or control that? We don't really, for the most part. It's the wild west when it comes to our data. Um, we're very voluntarily and enthusiastically making ourselves very trackable. Um, we're happy to carry devices. We want to connect with each other. We want to share. We want to understand. We want to optimize ourselves. And there's somewhat of a perfect storm of really cheap disk space so we can keep, slurp it all up and keep it forever. There's fast, readily available network access so we can get it from the point of collection to the point of storage. All these new types of tracking devices, willingness of people to carry them, a strong human desire to connect and share, and somewhat of a disinterest in privacy. That sounds like a pretty, you know, uh, that, that's uh, kind of the situation we're in. And if we take a few of these, you know, case studies and think about them a little more particularly, 
You know, if you think about wearable devices, things that track your activity patterns throughout the day, every time you take a step, or your sleep patterns, you know they do that, right? Have you seen the, the graphs when you woke up in the middle of the night? Um, you know, did someone else wake up next to you? <laughs> you know, your heart rate, no, wait a minute, is that okay? That, that that's all, you know, impliable from that? You know, do, did I realize I was sharing all of that stuff? Um, and most of those devices, are architected so that you have to contribute the data to the cloud before you can view it yourself. Have you noticed that? Would it be hard to write an application that would allow you to download that data, view it yourself, and then delete it? Or only keep it to yourself? Would that be a hard software engineering challenge? No. Why is it not like that? Because they value the data even more than the money you paid for that device. Um, uh, as I said, like the, all the educational stuff, the e-readers or the, think about the massively open online courses. Those are fabulous, right? Have anybody like, you know, taken advantage of kind of learning, you know, from some of the best in the world, you know, uh, courses online? Fabulous. But, you know, they've got to pay the bills, right? And there's a long history of universities making money off of their students in various ways. You probably know that, right? So for MOOCs to, to do it wouldn't be some huge departure. And they're probably not even covered by FERPA laws and things like that that universities are. So what about like how many times did it take you to take a test or try an exercise? Um, you know, what does that say about are you going to be a good employee or not? Are you really going to be good at this or not? Did you realize that you were, you were leaking that information or that, that that information could be sold to employers in that way? And here's an, a, a subtle point worth considering. Even if you don't participate, when people like you participate, there is some type of reputation sharing. So um, when there is kind of data mining done on that data, and you say, what will predict when somebody is good at a particular kind of job? What if it's that it predicts that women are especially good at that job? Or what if it's that they predict that women are especially not good at that job? And I didn't even participate. And I would say, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, like I get to stand on my own, you know, there. It's not legal, actually, <laughs> um, uh, in this country anyway. Um, so all sorts of, of um, things to think about in terms of how data is collected, when it's shared or swapped among organizations along with the identifying data. If you've ever read the privacy policies, they often say things like, we only share it with our trusted partners. What the heck does that mean? You know why most places will trust you? Because you paid them some money. <laughs> you know? So is that enough? Um, shared with governments. You know, the, the history of the partnerships between corporations and governments, corporations and each other. You know, uh, definitely an interesting one. Okay, so that is swapping of identifiable data. Then there is anonymous sharing of data. So and we're going to see some examples of that. And then, of course, whenever you collect valuable stuff, it could be stolen by hackers. There could be, you know, insider misuse of information. So all of this stuff that we're collecting, we need to think about the implications of it. And I want to talk a little bit about some categories, right? There's definitely data you know you're revealing. And even if you just stick to that, it makes a pretty scary picture when you put it all together. But obviously, if you're going to purchase something, you needed to tell them you wanted to purchase it. You had to tell them where to ship it, right? You know, you, obviously, you're giving information. Um, you know you're posting photos, you know you're, sh you know, so let's think of all the things we know we're giving. Then the fact that those could be aggregated together by swapping, you know, may with or without your permission. So that's the stuff we already talked about. Then we have to think about the things you don't even know you're revealing. You don't believe are being recorded. You really had no idea. So there's a great story of a uh, of a newspaper that gave a brand new cell phone to one of their employees and they said, just use it for a week. And it turned out that the, the GPS tagging was on for the photos. And maybe that, that person 
knew that it wasn't a good idea maybe to take a picture of their children like next to their address, the front of their house, or next to the name of their school or whatever and post that because that might say where their child is at all times. But if they posted those photos with the, with the GPS tagging, you basically were like, here's the exact schedule, the child's schedule for the entire week. And this is where their bedroom is, and this is where their homeroom is, and this is the route they, they walk, and this is where their babysitter is. So you know, that's an example of you didn't even know that that, was, that person didn't even know that was possible. Um, I already told you about the pattern of reading on e-readers. What about a private conversation on a subway train? Say you're in a subway train, just you and someone else in the car, no one else. Is that a private conversation? It's not. <laughs> but you might think it is. It might feel like it is. Um, so those are all examples of things you don't even know you're revealing. That's a whole other category. Then is the one I told you about where you're not exactly revealing who you are. You're just, they recognize you when they see you again. So I told you about that in the context of RFID. But also, it's similar with web browsing. Like your web browser and all of its plugins and language choices and everything serves almost as a fingerprint. And so if they see you again, they can tie that together, right? Um, similarly with like text samples from people, you might even if it's anonymous text, you'd be surprised the degree to which people feel like they can recognize text you wrote recognize code you wrote, things like that. And then here's another category I want to talk about is predictions from this data. So maybe you don't know anything for sure. But maybe you treat it like you do. Like maybe I liked the diabetes page on Facebook. Does that mean I have diabetes? Not necessarily. But maybe it does. What if you treat it like that's the case? Which is worse, that you knew it, or were right, or you guessed and were wrong. They're both kind of best. So it's, again, that kind of reputation sharing. Um, what about, the, you know, you buy prenatal vitamins at Target, and they assume you're pregnant. Is that, is that reasonable? Or the, the thing, I just saw an article today that your heart rate goes up on Fitbit, and they couldn't recognize when someone's pregnant on Fitbit. Again, you know, like, is that, is that information that, it's one thing if they get it from your doctor. It's another thing if they guess it and use it like they know it, especially if it's going to be used in really important decisions like hiring. Um, and in categories where there might not be the same protections there would be for the actual data versus the guess. Because predictions and guesses, I mean, is that just free speech? Right, I don't know. It's an interesting thing to think about. Now we've all seen this kind of information used for advertising. I'm sure every single person has had the experience. You searched for something somewhere, or you mentioned it in an email, and suddenly you're seeing advertisements for it on a completely different part of your life. So that is just kind of the tip of the iceberg. That's just seeing a little bit of what's going on. Another, it's more and more the case that these things are being used for big life-changing decisions. Do you get into college or not? Do you get a job or not? Do you keep your job or not? Do you, how much do you have to pay for your car insurance? How much do you have to pay for your health insurance? Um, allocation of public resources, like police in a neighborhood, or do you get out of jail or not, or do you get bail or not, or things like that. Um, and much like I was saying with the predictions from this data, you could look at actual potentially discriminatory attributes, like gender or race or things like that, or you could just guess them with very high degree of accuracy in many cases based on something that looks completely innocuous, like a Facebook like or a zip code you live in or, or something. And so asking how are these decisions being made feels to me like one of the defining questions of the age we're about to head into. Because what is happening with all of this digital exhaust is we are pointing machine learning algorithms at it and we're saying, learn some things about the world. We're going to use that to decide big things, little things about people's lives, but big things too. And the question is, how much accountability, 
How much transparency, how much fairness will there be in those decisions? You know, if, if there are you know, 500 resumes submitted for a job and, and, and a computer algorithm sorts them, what are the chances that the job goes to the top 20 candidates in the search list? And if you're in that group of candidates, do you have a right to know how that was sorted? I don't know. What do you think? It is the Wild West out there. Um, we, do we have a right to understand biases that are built in by programmers deliberately? Of course, if you ever built software, you know you could do that if you wanted to, right? But that is much less likely than what's really likely to happen is that historical biases, the biases that come out of language, the biases that come out of, our, uh, out of the historical actions of the world will be learned by machine learning algorithms and encoded forever in the way we make decisions about people's lives going forward, as if they were fundamentally good decisions. And I'll give you um, some examples to kind of illustrate my point. Can you imagine pointing a machine learning algorithm at handwritten digits and asking it to learn the digits 0 through 9? Doesn't seem too hard, right? You know, you have a data set that's labeled, this is a 5, this is a 0, this is a 3, and then you have another set that's not labeled, and you say, with how much accuracy can you correctly identify the digit? This doesn't seem like a very hard thing. And you might think that you could look at the way the computer made the decision, and it would be something like ones have a strong vertical, and fours have a strong horizontal, and eights are all about the curves, or something like that. But that's not the way it is. Here's an example of kind of the emphasis and the pixel maps of digits that a neural net used to make high accuracy decisions about digits. You look at that, that, that middle grouping, is an explanation jump out to you? Like this is how we decided to, you know, we recognize those digits? No, that's an example of kind of a black box decision making that is not explainable or understandable to a human. But now let me give you another one. Imagine that I gave you a set of pictures of dogs and wolves, correctly labeled dog or wolf, and then I asked the machine learning algorithm to learn which ones are dogs and which ones are wolves, and then it gave them a set and said, tell me whether it's a dog or a wolf. Does that seem like a very similar problem? And what if I could with very high accuracy do that? Turns out that um, one algorithm that did that did it simply by whether there's snow in the picture or not. If there's snow, it's likely to be a wolf, and if there's no snow, it's likely to be a dog. Okay. Now, what if with very high accuracy that works? And in the, in the best interest of the decision maker, it was efficient for them, in general they made good decisions? Is that okay? What about the dogs in the snow? This is, what I, this is what I want you to all think about. In your lifetime, I can promise you, you are going to be a dog in the snow. You are going to say, I, am I could be great at this job. Don't tell me I'm not. Right? I deserve that credit. I deserve this to get into college. I, uh, whatever. You are going to say that. And, and the world we're building right now is going to say, the exceptions don't matter. We don't care. This is a generally good algorithm, 99% accuracy, and, the, and why do we decide it? We just do because the computer said so. And, and they'll point you at something that looks like that, and they'll say that's why. So I, with, I, I can promise you, you will be a dog in the snow. What I can also promise you is that the vast majority of you will never know it. You just won't get a job. A particular job. You won't be at, you won't be offered a particular opportunity. You'll never hear about it. You will, you know. And there, I would highly recommend. I, I took a note from our first speaker who had some suggested reading, and I added that to my slides while I was sitting and listening to him. I would highly recommend the book, and I have a picture at the end: uh, "Weapons of Math Destruction" by Kathy O'Neill. She goes over some very specific. Have it, has anyone read that book? A couple of you <laughs> people in my class have read that book too. Yeah. So I highly recommend it. Um, and she goes over very specific case studies of 
teachers who lost their jobs because the computer algorithm said, you know, you're not a good teacher. Or, um, you know, students who, you know, some, a, a guy who um, had been at Vanderbilt, had really high SAT scores and couldn't get a single minimum wage job because of the five-factor personality test they were all asking him to take. Um, just case after case after case. And like in, the, in that particular case, I think his name was Kyle Bem, the only reason he found out is kind of a fluke that somebody told him why he wasn't getting the job. And then his father was a lawyer and like tracked it down and like sued all like a block of companies. Um, and you know, are you going to think of all the decisions that are gonna be made? Are you gonna have the energy to track them all down? Or are they just going to be death by a thousand cuts? Right? You can't investigate them all. You can't get an answer on any of them. And, and prediction becomes our destiny. I mean, I'm, I, wish I, I wish I was talking about science fiction. I really, really do. But I'm not. That's what's happening right now. Um, here's another one. Uh, this is a real thing. Uh, there was a credit card that would uh, raise your interest rates and lower your credit limit if you happen to charge marriage counseling. So what we're living in is a world where we cannot predict the potential pain of our actions. Should I like this thing on Facebook or not? Should I charge this on my credit card or not? Should I accept this colleague on LinkedIn or not? Should, what if I just happen to be physically near a demonstration site? This was another case, I think, out of, it was either out of Weapons of Mount Destruction or another book I'm going to recommend, Data and Goliath by Bruce Schneier. It said, it was not in the U.S., but another country, like, people with cell phones were near where a mass demonstration was going, and they, they popped up a note on their phones that said, you are being registered as a participant in a mass demonstration. Just because they were in the, in the area physically. They may or may not have wanted to participate, but even if they wanted to participate, is that the world you want to live in? That is the world we're living in. And in some places, it's just a little more subtly disguised than others. Um, here's another uh, thing I will, I will share with you. Um, although that almost is one of the, the biggest lessons I want you to take away what I just covered. But another issue is the idea of anonymity um, in big data. So, there is this question of can we collect this digital exhaust from people and remove the personally identifiable parts and then get the best of both worlds. Like we protect people, but we still can get these high demographic conclusions about that let us optimize our world and search for malaria and you know, figure out who learns better, who sleeps better, or whatever. Um, the thing is, is the history of anonymous release of data is not very good. Um, I don't know uh, if you heard the case um, from a little over a decade ago, the AOL search data. This was literally people's you know, web searches that, that kind of shows the internals of your brain. They removed the username column. And then you know, researchers looked at that data and they said, I'm pretty sure we can tell who these people are. And they went to the people and they said, are these your web searches? And the people said, yes. Now, just imagine, for example, if I showed you all your web searches, could you recognize them? I bet you could. You'd go, oh, yeah, that, yeah, all right, I remember. Ah, oh, yeah, that's it. Okay, yeah, these are mine. <laughs> you know? Okay. And then imagine they are out there, all of them, and a researcher calls you up and asks you if they're yours. How happy are you? You're not very happy, right? So that, that actually happened. That's not science fiction. That actually happened. And how did they recognize us? Because we search for our own names. We search for things near us. We search for but the same thing. Like if you keep locate, if, if, if you took all of the location data off your cell phone, just the GPS locations over time, nothing else, you could recognize who you are. Because you can see where you live and you see where you work. And maybe the intersection of that is one person. And even if it's not, you know, a little extra information and you got it, right? Do not, un so the stuff that you think of as being personally identifiable, there's so much else that's personally identifiable. And what is not personally identifiable today might be personally identifiable tomorrow because we learn better how to correlate things. Um, here's another one. Uh, so 
how many people rate movies in Netflix because you rate them in movies in Netflix will give you suggestions of other ones. And it just helps you remember. You're like, oh, right, I, I, I remember now. I like that one. That was a five. How many people rate movies in Netflix? Okay, so Netflix released the recommendation, a bunch of recommendation data. Again, they had pulled off the, you know, the directly identifiable name type information. And then researchers correlated those with public ratings on IMDb. So I bet fewer people go to the trouble of rating things publicly on IMDb. But if you did, could you imagine that maybe in IMDb you fessed up to liking certain movies? And then maybe it's those other movies that you're like, I don't really want to admit I watched it, let alone that I gave it a five. But what they saw is that they could take the public fingerprint of the movies that they had rated and match that with the Netflix, and they could find the same person. That, again, not science fiction, that, that actually happened. Um, and another one is the, the health records for the governor of Massachusetts. So LaTanya Sweeney took um, public voting records and also some medical data that was not public, but it was swapped around widely. Like if you were a researcher or a company or whatever, you could get your hands on it very easily. And um, the governor of Massachusetts could be uniquely identified by his birth date, gender, and five-digit zip code. Like 87% of the US population or something like that. And so she de-anonymized his health records. Now, could she have de-anonymized many other people's? Yes, by the same thing. Why him? Well, I guess you could say this disclosure happened on his watch, right? Um, again, the and I remember, in addition to that, that de-anonymizing, she had a proposal. She said, here's something you can do to data to ensure that it has certain anonymity properties. And she called it k-anonymity. She said, we're going to massage the data a little bit. We're going to replace some columns by averages or take out some data or whatever. We're going to massage it to the point that there's no question you can ask that will return fewer than k answers. So you can always hide in a crowd of k. And, I, and you can set the KV over whatever you want, 10, 100, 10,000, whatever you want. So you could ensure a certain property. And I remember reading that when it first came out, like, wow, that's great. We can have the best of both worlds. But then it was interesting, not too long, some other researchers came and said, wait a minute, no, not so fast. There's all these problems with canonymity. For example, what if you're hiding in a crowd and everybody in the crowd has a certain sense of attribute? Like everyone in the crowd has AIDS, say, for example. Well, then you have AIDS because you're in that crowd. Or potentially even worse, like I said, the reputation sharing. What if 90% of the people in that crowd do? You don't, but they just assume you do because with 90% probability you do. Right? And they make a decision about you on that basis. And then it doesn't even stop there. Like the L diversity people who poked holes in canonymity, they had a solution. Then more people came and were like, uh-uh, not so fast, you screwed it up too. And they were the T closeness people. And basically what I've learned over time is that you really have to degrade the data set to the point that it's not that useful in order to really have any anonymity property. So basically, you might as well just trust the researchers that have it. And that basically means if you trust them, they probably shouldn't be releasing it anonymously or swapping it around anyway. So um, can we have the best of both worlds? I'm not so sure. I definitely come away with, the, with, the, with you know, lessons like whenever I feel anonymous, I really ought to just beware and basically say, you know, like, you know, you know, your mother or your grandmother told you don't say anything um, in private that you wouldn't say in public. But do I really want to live that way? Is that really the way we want our society to be? That we never have any space for privacy? I don't necessarily think so. And a lot of people say, what do I have to hide? Like, who cares? I don't have anything to hide. Look at anything in my life. I don't care. But before you say that, I think you should think carefully. Because don't we all need space to kind of try on and develop new ideas to say something like, you know, I took a stake in the ground and then you convinced me I was wrong and I've grown and I don't want to be held accountable for that old thing anymore. Or, you know, do you always agree with the government? Do you feel like you should have a right to express some dissent? I think I do. I often disagree to tell you the truth. Um, if you don't have space that allows you to discuss and consider the idea you hate the most, I think that that's a real problem. If just by going and even considering it, reading about it, liking it on Facebook, watching that YouTube video, you're some, suddenly implicated, 
that is a recipe for a society in which we, we can't discuss. We can't grow. We're all afraid of what the implications of every Facebook like or every friend or every comment are. That is chilling, horrible stuff. I think you also have the right to keep private what others might use to prejudge you. Right? You, you, you say, I don't think you have a right to know that. What you have a right to know is that I'm great at my job, and that's what you have a right to know, and everything else you don't need to know in this case. Right? But companies want to know everything about you, and governments want to know everything about you. And you know what else? They don't want you to know anything about them. They don't want transparency or accountability. And that is the world we're living in. And if we don't do something about it, it's going to get worse. I think I see all around me the signs of the shifting balance of power between corporations and governments and individual people. And it's not a good story right now. And this is contributing to that. And in a world where machine learning and computing and data is going to be used to help governments and corporations make efficient decisions about consumer sheep. I don't really think I like that. And I hope you don't like it either. Um, and if you don't, what are some things I think you could do? Well, I don't really recommend living paranoid. I've thought carefully about that possibility, and I'll tell you the story that convinced me out of it. There was a book about somebody who was trying to live completely untrackable. Like, he put all his assets in trust, and anytime he shipped something, it went to a Dropbox, and like crazy, you know. And you know, same the techno technology things. Do you guys watch the Citizen Four documentary with Edward Snowden? He's got the hood over his head typing. I mean, if you're going to do what Snowden did, you might want to be a little paranoid. I mean, maybe then I might recommend living paranoid. He's still alive, which is kind of stunning, I think. Um, uh, you know, but all of the, you guys know, that in terms of the technological solutions, and there are some, you have to be so careful. You know, one little slip up. So, okay, let me finish the story about the guy with the, with the drop boxes. His aunt got him a magazine subscription for Christmas. So what, you're not gonna ever have your friends and family over to your house ever? And that's kind of like, for me, it was like, okay, that's an end game, right? I'm not going down that rat hole of, of paranoia because I don't want to live like that. And then here's the other one. Uh, in Data and, uh, the Data and Goliath book, he talks about, um, say you were going to go to a really private meeting. Could you imagine like turning off your cell phone and taking out the battery and whatever? Be like, I'm, we're going to have this meeting in a field, no cell phone or whatever. Do you know, he says in that book that the NSA also watches for phones that are turned off in the same vicinity of one another. And then asks, what are the possible connections between those people? So whether it's that example or another, you just cannot be careful enough. You just can't think, out, out think everything. So instead, you know, I mean, turn off tracking when you don't really need it. Don't install apps you don't really need. You know, challenge data collection requests, like why do you need that information? You know, um, provide aggregated information rather than specific information. Yes, do those things, but you know, I wouldn't recommend getting too paranoid about it. I think you should lobby for laws that give individuals the right to inspect, correct, and delete their data. That any company or government that's going to hold data about you, you should be able to ask and inspect what they've got. I think that would be a good one. I also think a great one would be um, a requirement that when, when corporations and governments swap information with each other, that they keep a trail of provenance. Like, I got it from you, you got it from me. And then I'd say that's a lot of data, but you know what? That's what big data is about. If you can track my every location every second, you can keep track of when you gave it to someone. Don't tell me you can't. <laughs> um, similarly with lobbying for, building interfaces that allow you to view your own data without contributing it to a cloud, using services that su do support stronger privacy and anonymity, and anonymity properties, holding governments and companies accountable for their data collection and use, you know, so when you find out that some um, part of our government has been lying to Congress, maybe don't forget that. <laughs> you know, like, should, should, you know, maybe you can't tell all of the public, but if you can't tell the only, you know, um, elected representative tasked with your oversight, 
maybe that's off the rails. <laughs> you know? Maybe that's just not okay. Um, push for transparency and symmetry. Um, models for successful data sharing. Another thing I would say is there are certain categories of machine learning algorithms that are more explainable than others, like decision trees versus neural nets and whatever. And maybe we have to say for big public decisions like housing, jobs, you get out of jail or not, those kind of things have to be done with machine learning algorithms that are slightly less efficient if they have to be, that can export an explainable, human readable, understandable version. Um, many things. But um, you know, I am I'm skeptical of our ability to have it all. I'm very skeptical of our ability to have it all. And um, I would recommend uh, these two books if you'd like to know more, Data and Goliath by Bruce Schneier and Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy Muniel. Questions? So uh, the common expression I've heard is a computer does not have to be perfect. It only has to be better than human. So in respect to being a dog in the snow, I would argue that this problem existed before computers had a prominent role in candidate selection. That's an, that's an excellent point. So, you know, do people make biased decisions? Clearly people make biased decisions, right? But you know what? People can be reasoned with. You can present additional information. You can argue your point. And also people evolve a little over time. You embed a particular, learn, you, you take a particular data set and you train it and you, you say, okay, we're making good enough decisions, we think we're fine with these decisions, and you embed that. Could you imagine living with that computer system that makes decisions like that for the next 15, 20 years? Yes, I can. Um, and here's another thing. I hate it especially when things are sold as the exact opposite of what they are even more than I hate it when they're just bad. So when something is labeled as a completely unbiased decision made by computers, that is not what is happening. So yes, people might have been biased, but if then you're gonna make just as biased a decision based on, trained on historical data sets or just as unfair or unfair in different ways, and in that same time, you're going to sell it as completely unbiased, done by computer, we have no more problem here. I think that that is an especially horrible recipe. And um, all you have to do is look in the news right now. If there was a computer algorithm that could you know, decide who gets into the US and who doesn't and make it look completely unbiased, done by computer, but could subtly make the decisions that some people want made, that would not be an improvement. And you think you can't do that? You can do that very easily. Next question? Did you have another one? Other questions? Actually, I have one. Okay. <laughs> You know, when you can't predict the outcome of, of your response, then it's really, there's no, there's no right answer. Um, you know, that sometimes having no credit, for example, can mean you don't get loans, just as like having bad credit does. So withholding information can, can lead you in a bad path. Um, I've looked, you know, I don't know if you've looked at any of those companies like Axiom, I think that is. Like you can go and you can actually look at your, your consumer profile they've put together and you can edit it if you want. I, I would encourage you to do that. Mine is really wrong. I, you know, lots of people I know go and look at it, it's really wrong. So, you know, you provide data, they make wrong conclusions, they make right conclusions. You tell me which is worse. I'm not sure. Um, for me, I think it has to be about 
um, transparency and accountability. And um, I really, um, I'm focusing right now on ways to make machine learning algorithms um, explainable and accountable so that at least if people want to do it, it can be done. Because it's better than saying, we want to do it, but we have no idea how to do it. Okay, so at least let's figure out how to do it. And, you know, I have in, I have in my mind some things that I think would be really great legislative things to do, but I'm not sure that there's currently the will to do them. Um, but, you know, I... I'm arguing and educating and continuing to put those forward as what I think is good directions. Ultimately, governments and corporations are not going to lead this. They like it the way it is. It has to be, it has to be individuals. It has to be the exceptions. It has to be the dogs in the snow, right? And so what I say, I say to my students, I say, would you like to get outraged now? Or do you want to wait until you know it's happened to you or someone you love? Which would you like to do? You know, um, I'm trying to get outraged now, but I know that it's a lot of energy to be outraged. <laughs> we only have so much energy. You have to pick your battles. I'm, I am in particular picking this one as part of one thing I care a lot about. Um, I usually say to people, I will respect you as long as you pick some battle and fight. You can't pick them all, but please pick some. I think if we all pick some and do the best we can on those, that would be a really good improvement. Um, so find something you're passionate about and fight on it. I think given computing security people, these are good ones. Bruce Schneier, you, you, know, you guys know him, right? You know? So uh, we have some expertise here. We can understand these issues in ways that a lot of people can't. The, uh, if you haven't picked one yet, pick this one. You'll like it. It's worth it. Other questions? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I respect that choice. That's not the way I've personally gone, um, but I, I respect that choice. Yeah. Um, other questions?